Good evening. My name is Alelia Bundles, and I am Radcliffe College and Harvard College class of 1974. And I just spent... <laughs> And I just spent the weekend in Cambridge at my 45th reunion, which was lots of fun. We have, we, I, we have a really special class. What can I? I know everybody's class is special, but ours is really special. Uh, and I just want to welcome you here. What an incredible turnout. Um, thank you all for coming. We have a wide range of ages and connections. Uh, Harvard and Radcliffe and not Harvard and Radcliffe and people who love the mission of what is going on. When the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study was founded 20 years ago, those of us who were lucky enough to be in the room during the planning stages hoped it would blossom into something that was both special and powerful. We knew its roots in the Radcliffe College community gave it a strong connection to 120 years of women's education and the careful selection of Drew Faust as the first dean set the tone for intellectual rigor and visionary leadership. And we all know how that worked out. <laughs> With the fabulous first woman president of Harvard University. I'm a proud Radcliffe College and Harvard College uh, alumni, part of that transi transition generation of co-ed dorms, Radcliffe admi admissions, and Harvard diplomas who gets to claim both institutions. And I realize now that I'm one of those ancient people I used to watch carrying the Radcliffe banner during commencement. I'm still secretary of my class, and I was the second to last president of the Radcliffe College Alumni Association when there was such a thing. Radcliffe may no longer be a standalone college, but the institution now is more than the sum of its parts, including the Schlesinger Library on the History of Women in America, the Radcliffe Fellows, several other initiatives, and robust intellectual and public programming. What now is the Radcliffe Fellows Program, and I saw several former Bunting Fellows and Radcliffe Fellows, began in 1961 as a postgraduate study center for women scholars and artists that provided time, financial support, and membership in a vital community of women with access to all Radcliffe and Harvard resources. Polly Bunting, who then was Radcliffe's president, conceived it in the tradition of Virginia Woolf's wish for a room of one's own when such a thing was difficult for women to find. Today, a Radcliffe Fellowship is much coveted. There are even men who are Radcliffe Fellows. And I'm told that it could be entirely filled by Harvard professors who are clamoring to spend their sabbaticals in beautiful Radcliffe Yard. But wise people know that a mix and some diversity is really important. We build on this tradition by cherishing our alumni, making connections with undergraduates, and taking our story to those of you who see common ground with our mission of interdisciplinary study. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Tamiko Brown Nagan, Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, who also is the Daniel P.S. Paul Professor of Constitutional Law at Harvard Law School and Professor of History at Harvard. I remember when there were no women in the Department of History at Harvard, so things have changed a lot. As the fourth dean of the Radcliffe Institute, she brings expertise in constitutional law and education law and policy. She has published articles and book chapters on a wide range of topics, including the Supreme Court, civil rights law and history, and the Affordable Care Act. Among her awards is a Bancroft, Bancroft Prize in US history. During her time as a Radcliffe Fellow, she moved forward with her biography on, about Constance Baker Motley, the path-breaking attorney, politician, and judge, whose son Joel Motley is my classmate. <laughs> her book is forthcoming. Dean Brown Nagan earned her de law degree from Yale, where she was editor of the Law Review. She received a BA in history, summa cum laude, from Furman University, and her doctorate in history from Duke University. Please help me welcome Dean Tomiko Nick Brown Nagan. Thank you. 
you. Thank you. Thank you so much to Alilia for that beautiful introduction. You know, I spend a lot of time uh, talking to friends and supporters of the Institute and people who don't know a lot about it, trying to show the linkages between Radcliffe College and what we are today. And you did it beautifully uh, in the span of those two minutes. I really appreciate um, that introduction as well as all that you do for the Radcliffe Institute and for the Schlesinger Library. Thank you. I also want to start with uh, some other special thank yous. Tonight, I am delighted uh, to be joined by members of the Ratcliffe Associates Program, the Anne Ratcliffe Society, and our Ratcliffe Institute uh, Leadership Society. The Institute's remarkable array of programs and fellowships, ex exhibitions, are free and open to the public because of you, thanks to your generosity. Uh, we really appreciate it. We also are joined by distinguished alumni and alumnae of Radcliffe and uh, Harvard, as you heard. And we have a lot of people in the audience uh, for whom this event is your first introduction to the Radcliffe Institute. Uh, I'm so glad to have you here. Thanks for coming. Finally, I want to extend my appreciation to the Harvard uh, Alumni Association and the Harvard Club of Washington, DC. So before uh, I dive into the topic at hand on the relationship between the US Supreme Court and social change, I did want to spend just a, a few minutes talking about myself and why I am absolutely delighted and honored to be the fourth dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, now beginning my second year as dean. So when I decided, and I was honored to be asked to be uh, the dean of the institute, um, I was so happy to accept that position um, because of the intellectual community that I found uh, as a Radcliffe Fellow in 2016. Um, as Alilia explained, I'm trained in both history and law. And for an interdisciplinary scholar like me, Radcliffe really did and still does uh, feel like home. And as Alilia said, during my fellowship year, I worked on uh, a biography of Constance Baker Motley. It is forthcoming soon. Um, Motley uh, was a pathbreaking civil rights lawyer who worked with Thurgood Marshall. Um, she was Manhattan Borough President, and then she was on the bench for uh, 30 years and uh, involved in the country's great social reform movement. And um, it was really special for me to to work on that book at the Institute, um, including because of that interdisciplinary community, but also because of the Schlesinger Library, um, where, as uh, I've, I've said to a number of people before, the work in the archives of the Schlesinger allowed me to add a layer um, to my work about Motley that was missing. Uh, so I went to archives all over the country and learned a great deal about her. But it was at the Schlesinger Library where I was able to appreciate the social network of women uh, who were behind her and who were breaking barriers at the same time that she was. And so um, I, I learned during that year um, how really important it is to have um, the Schlesinger as a part of a core part of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Um, I also want to say that the Radcliffe Institute isn't only a place for fellows and scholars. It is a place where we serve broad audiences who come to Harvard to uh, explore urgent issues um, guided by the best thinkers, the most creative thinkers uh, in the world. It is a home for curiosity. Um, and creativity. It is a place of inclusion and opportunity. We're building on the history of Rock of College in viewing ourselves in that way. And it is um, an institute that is poised uh, after um, uh, building on a firm foundation, a strong foundation, it is poised to do even more in the future. Uh, during uh, my deanship, we are going to carry out that founding mandate um, to 
uh, blend the disciplines into this wonderful community, but we're also going to make sure that we're integrating applied uh, subjects. So um, we're going to make sure we have people uh, who are from the professions, from law and medicine, who are um, interested in issues like public health and education, um, all with the goal of promoting civic engagement and informed leadership. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really honored to be leading Radcliffe at this, uh, this uh, challenging time, but also a wonderful time uh, to be a leader in higher education. And now I want to turn to my substantive remarks about the Supreme Court and uh, social change. And I have to say, I'm so happy to be doing this because there's an irony involved in being uh, an administrator which is that you're chosen in part because of your scholarship, but then when you're administrator, you're not, you don't really have time to talk about one scholarship. Uh, and so this is an exception when I am able to tell you a little bit about um, uh, my scholarship and uh, to talk about the long view of uh, the Supreme Court and social change. Now, when Americans think about social change, they often think about the US Supreme Court, and that's for good reason. The court has often been uh, the focus of debate and angst in conversations about large-scale social problems and the large-scale policy and legal interventions that often have been deemed necessary to address those problems. Debate about the court's relationship to social change has been uh, most prominent during uh, historical moments when our country appeared to be on the brink of division and disaster. I'm talking about history. <laughs> So I mean periods like the 1860s when our country repeatedly uh, met the issue of, of slavery in Congress and in the courts. In the 1870s through the early 20th century uh, when women fought for suffrage. During the Great Depression of the 1930s when Congress passed and the Supreme Court repeatedly uh, reviewed expansive legislation. And more recently I'll give you the example of the Affordable Care Act where uh, the Supreme Court was at the center of this great debate about uh, American health care. During these moments of cataclysm, economic insecurity, um, commentators often asked what is the appropriate role uh, for unelected justices in a constitutional system that is premised on an elegant design of separated powers and federalism. Now, it's because there's so much intellectual and political energy focused on uh, the court that debates over who should sit on the court have become increasingly fraught over time, as you probably uh, have noticed. So every time a seat opens up on the court, this happens. Um, we uh, see a list of names, there's a parlor game um, that occurs where commentators try to figure out who's on the short list. Um, and they opine about what each name might signal about the future of important issues like reproductive rights or campaign finance reform or environmental protection. And so, of course, we witnessed this phenomenon following Justice Scalia's death uh, and Justice Kennedy's retirement from the court. Uh, some groups were up in arms, as, as this uh, slide shows, uh, before the nominee was even announced. And so the question is, what is driving this phenomenon? And I would say it's two uh, assumptions that animate this political theater. The first is the assumption that the identity of a justice really matters. That the choice of candidate X versus candidate Y could portend disaster on this issue or that one. The second matter that is driving this phenomenon is the idea that the Supreme Court is a uniquely powerful institution and that the justices are inclined uh, to protect 
against the tyranny of the majority, to quote um, the Federalist 51 and James Madison. Now, I'm not going to argue here that the identity of a justice does not matter. In fact, I think that on the margins, individual members of the court can be important, and yet um, I don't think it uh, makes as much of a difference as people tend to think, and there's uh, lots of political science literature on that point. Now, nor am I going to directly engage uh, the assumption that the court is uniquely situated to guard against tyranny. Although, I have to say, I've written about that issue, and the short answer is don't hold your breath uh, for that one. So my thesis is at once uh, more narrow and broader. It relates not only to the court, but to our entire constitutional design and democratic system. What I hope to persuade you of is that rhetoric about the court's role and its impact and about who sits on the court promotes a far too court-centric understanding of our constitutional democracy. Um, the overemphasis on the court actually minimizes the role of we, the people, uh, as voters, as donors, as members of interest groups who are engaged with the legal order. Now, one way to explain what I'm driving at is to remember Justice Oliver Wendell, Wendell Holmes, his insight. Um, Holmes famously said that the life of the law has not been logic, it has been experience, experience. So in the remainder of this talk, what I'm going to do is to discuss that idea, the idea of experience or events that are external to law uh, to legal doctrine affecting constitutional law. So one type of experience that can be a driver of change is popular movements or citizens who are mobilized in support of a cause. And here what I'm going to focus on is how those movements shape and are shaped by the law and how they use the law to try to spur change. And when I'm talking about popular movements, I'm talking about uh, movements like this. Um, importantly, they can lean in any ideological direction. They can be conservative and status quo preserving, uh, like the Tea Party, or they can be liberal and change oriented, um, like the movement for marriage equality or uh, Me Too, which is one that we've heard a lot about recently. So the particular point that I want to make about law and social change in relation to these popular movements is that they deploy rights talk to frame disputes, to tell stories, and to move forward their agendas. They cite the Constitution, the paramount law, to quote Chief Justice John Marshall, as well as aspirational texts, such as the Declaration of Independence, the preamble to the Constitution, along with Supreme Court decisions, always typically loosely interpreted, along with popular understandings of what the law should be. And they're all doing this to support their claims about what is fair, what is fair. Um, so this is quite a different kind of endeavor than the nuts and bolts of legal cases, and yet really important in my view. And so I would say that these movements deploy legal discourse uh, in four major ways to make legal claims, which is the uh, conventional way, for moral suasion, for cultural identification, and for political mobilization which is to say that law is deployed in a strategic manner and opportunistically. Now, having established that conceptual framework, I want to look at history, at uh, signature episodes in legal and social history to illustrate that law and social change is really about much more than winning a case in the Supreme Court, I say humbly in Washington, D.C., not far from the court. So I want to 
start off by um, considering 19th century conflicts. And I'll first focus on abolitionists um, who amidst the controversy over slavery um, invoked legal rhetoric for moral suasion and for political mobilization. Um, the abolitionists did so in the context of cases like Dred Scott versus Sanford, one of the most notorious, probably the most notorious, decision in constitutional law. This is the one where Justice Taney, and his brothering on the Supreme Court, sought to solve the sectional crisis uh, by removing slavery, the regulation of slavery, um, from the states and Congress. He did so in a decision that said that no person of African descent could be a citizen of the United States, which was a sweeping pronouncement that answered a question that no one actually asked, uh, which is a clue, um, but something's a mess. Now, the point that I want to make is that in response to the Dred Scott decision, the abolitionist movement didn't focus their energies on, say, packing the Supreme Court. Instead, this movement engaged in resistance to slavery inside and outside of the court system. So here we have Frederick Douglass, the former slave turned internationally known abolitionist, uh, who called Dred Scott monstrous. And on speaking tours, Douglas used Dred Scott to mobilize the public in support of his cause. So in a 19, uh, excuse me, 1860 speech to the Constitution of the United States, is it pro-slavery or anti-slavery, Douglas demolished the court's arguments in Dred Scott. He argued that the Constitution did not support a pro-slavery uh, position. And he did this through uh, an ingenious textual interpretation of the Constitution that set aside the political or economic motives of the framers. So Douglas argued that far from sanctioning slavery, the Constitution went to great lengths to avoid doing so. And so he pointed to uh, the three-fifths clause, which he said worked a disability on the slaveholding states, depriving them of representation. He talked about the slave trade clause um, and how it stipulated that the trade would actually end in 50 years. And so uh, Douglas resisted and advanced his cause by paying homage to the Constitution, uh, doing an in run around the justices. And so you see, uh, he's saying that the Constitution itself, the words of the text are supreme, not the justices themselves. I also want to talk about William Lloyd Garrison, who was the publisher of The Liberator and the leader of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, who took quite a different tact from Douglas. So Garrison called the Constitution a bloody and a wicked document. And he actually set it on fire at a 4th of July event, saying that the Constitution was wicked precisely because it produced cases like Dred Scott. Um, so Garrison, in contrast to Douglas, had a contempt for the Constitution, and that level of contempt presaged violent disunion and uh, the Civil War. And so in the end, the Supreme Court's decision in Dred Scott had exactly the opposite of the intended impact. It caused those who had been on the sidelines to choose a side, uh, to choose abolitionism or to uh, choose slavery. And many chose abolition and committed themselves to fighting uh, slavery until the death. And no abolitionists believe that the personnel or the decisions of the US Supreme Court defined or constrained their political goals. Now, I want to talk about uh, the fight for women's suffrage, uh, honoring the upcoming uh, 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. Um, so women's rights advocates deployed rights talk as well to push forward their agendas. And so uh, when you think about this movement, you think about uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who organized a sophisticated strategy uh, to promote suffrage. And once again, 
adverse law motivated, animated their struggle. So what do I mean? Well, first of all, the Reconstruction Amendments where, um, and the court's interpretation of the Reconstruction Amendments um, that ended up being catalysts for this movement. And that's because in the course of mandating freedom for former slaves, Congress inscribed on freedom uh, for women. So the 14th Amendment explicitly connected political representation to males, and the 15th Amendment left women out of the prohibition against discrimination and voting. And it's after the passage uh, of these amendments that advocates for women's rights redouble their efforts um, to seek equality for themselves. And they used an array of tactics to fight uh, discrimination. They turned to litigation, for instance. Um, there was the case of Minor versus Happersett, a famous case where a woman was denied uh, the right to register to vote. The case went all the way up to the Supreme Court where the court held that while women are citizens under the 14th Amendment, the amendment did not actually confer voting rights to women. And so it's without recourse in uh, the Supreme Court that these women and their allies turn to an array uh, of uh, tactics, including mass meetings, um, education and public persuasion campaigns. Um, they advocated for suffrage in uh, women's clubs. They enlisted uh, male allies um, to help them fight. And some uh, women engaged in civil disobedience. Um, most famously, Susan B. Anthony voted illegally in the presidential election of 1872. Um, she then used her trial to argue that her <coughs> conviction violated the spirit of the Constitution. And so Anthony uh, said, uh, it said that she cited the preamble to the Constitution, which said, we the people, not we the male citizens, nor yet we uh, the, excuse me, the white male citizens, nor yet we the male citizens, but we the whole people who form the union. And so she's showing that the language of the Constitution did not uh, mean to exclude women. Um, there were lots of other tactics, including uh, lobbying uh, state and federal officials, including uh, President Wilson, who ultimately endorsed women's suffrage in an address before Congress. Um, and yet, I want to say that the fight for women's suffrage was still without, not without controversy, even among women. Um, there were female anti-suffragists who claimed that only a minority of women uh, wanted to enter uh, politics, and yet, ultimately, the face of the Constitution changed. Um, and adverse law had mobilized the suffragists. The Constitution changed, and yet, um, as we know, women of color, including in the South, remain um, unable to exercise the vote because of poll taxes, uh, literally test, literacy tests, and so forth. Which brings us to the Civil Rights Movement. 20th century examples of political mobilization and the law. So the civil rights movement featured, featured citizens pushing for racial change by invoking constitutional discourse to make their cases. And yet, I know who you're thinking of. It's Thurgood Marshall, but I don't mean Thurgood Marshall. I'll get to him. I am thinking instead about Dr. King, who was the leader of the nonviolent civil disobedience campaign against segregation in Montgomery, Birmingham, Selma, and so forth. King frequently deployed the law for moral suasion. He invoked constitutional concepts such as liberty, equality, and citizenship, the very idea of the rule of law, uh, he quoted the Declaration of Independence, all to argue that racial discrimination violated both the laws of God and of man. 
King articulated these views during the famed Montgomery bus boycott of 1955 at the Holt Street Baptist Church, where he said, we are here because first and foremost, we are American citizens and we are determined to apply our citizenship to the fullness of its means. We are also here because of our love for democracy, because of our deep-seated belief that democracy transformed from thin paper, so from the laws, to thick action is the greatest form of government on earth. And it is by articulating a vision of equality that was deeply rooted uh, in the American dream and in these uh, legal principles and coupling uh, his sermons with uh, resistance in the streets that Dr. King and the people who supported King laid the groundwork for the uh, change, social change, for racial change, for the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And so, here's the puzzle. If I'm correct, if the Supreme Court typically has not been the heroic actor in struggles over social change, then why have we come to place so much trust, so much trust in the justices to protect against tyranny and to inspire change. And I would argue that it all goes back to World War II, to 1954, and to the struggle over segregation in the South. And now I'll talk about Thurgood Marshall. So the five cases that Marshall brought challenging school segregation under the 14th Amendment ended up in the Supreme Court, and as you know, uh, Marshall prevailed on behalf of his clients. The unanimous Brown case came to be seen as a textbook example of the nine justices siding with discrete and insular minorities against uh, an oppressive majority. But the point that I want to make is that, in fact, the history is a bit more complicated. Um, the context is vital to understanding why the justices actually ruled in favor of Marshall's clients. They did so in no small part because of the wartime context uh, and because of their recognition that Jim Crow actually compromised U.S. national security. In propaganda campaigns aimed at nations in Africa, in Asia, and in Europe, the Soviets pointed to Jim Crow to argue that the US, which claimed to be a democratic nation and that um, said that it was morally superior, in fact was hypocritical. And so conversations among the justices reveal their sensitivity to this geopolitical context, as uh, some of my colleagues have written, Professor Mary Diziak and Michael Klarman, for example. Justice Hugo Black calls segregation Hitler's creed. And Justice uh, Robert Jackson had been a prosecutor of Nazis at Nuremberg. Um, so they were very acquainted with this larger context, and yet, once the Supreme Court issued its decision, that context, that complexity fell away. And the justices became the heroes of the story and Thurgood Marshall became a legend in his own time. And there he is uh, on the steps of the Supreme Court. Now, in the coming years, commentators praised Brown as the greatest constitutional case of the 20th century, a decision that reconsecrated American ideals, according to Richard Kluger, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. And papers, newspapers nationwide published uh, photographs like this one, this iconic photo uh, depicting the US Supreme Court as having saved the nation by creating opportunity for little girls uh, like this one. And so I would say that decades later, the reputation of the court uh, that was earned in 1954 
mostly remains intact because the decision itself has stood the test of time. Now, to be sure, uh, there were those who criticized uh, the Brown decision. There were those who, after Brown, believed that the Warren court uh, intruded too far into American life. Nevertheless, the decision itself is sacrosanct. Uh, virtually every commentator asserts that it was correctly decided. And the only Supreme Court nominee in recent memory who declared that Brown was wrongly decided, um, Robert Bork, was not in fact confirmed um, when uh, civil rights and women's rights group led the opposition to him. And so there it is. The outsized reputation of the Supreme Court and the fever pitch over who is nominated goes far back into history to Brown, no matter that the public understanding of the case itself gives a misleading impression about the court's role in social change. And so in conclusion, I'll return to the present and the phenomenon that's represented by uh, these face shots. So the next time you see this list, I hope you'll appreciate the lessons that are taught by legal and social history uh, of the kind that I've discussed here. As an historical matter, and as a matter of constitutional design, liberty resides in the people. Law, in fact, is a plural concept. It's not just the Supreme Court and legal institutions, but it's ideology. Um, it's a tool, it's a tactic, it's a lot of things. And so effective use of the law can be about much more than winning a Supreme Court case. Um, the Supreme Court plays a limited role in our elegant system that is premised on popular sovereignty and three functioning branches of government. Thank you.